Thank you, Brother Steve, and good evening, brethren and sisters and young people. Well, the re-election of uh, Barack Obama as the President of the United States of America and the unchanged situation in the House of uh, the Congress and in the Senate uh, means that it's the status quo uh, in the US. And the gridlock that has characterised their political life for the last few years looks like continuing. Some of you will be aware that uh, they are talking about the financial cliff, uh, which they will reach very shortly in January when, by legislation, they're not permitted to borrow beyond a certain amount. Some of you might know that there's a clock that actually ticks over with the amount that America is borrowing from the rest of the world, and it's going up at a dreadful rate. The Republicans don't want taxes to be increased, especially against the wealthy. And the Democrats don't want to reduce social programs, which the Republicans are demanding. So it's not going to go very far. I think that, brothers and sisters, along with the storm of last week, or whenever it was, I think it was last week, uh, which will cost them squillions at the end of the day, uh, just another set of circumstances that the angels are bringing to pass to ensure that the great cra crash, the collapse, of not only of America's economy but of the world economy uh, is going to happen. When that will happen, we don't know. It's been coming for a while, but it will happen. And when it goes over the edge, there will be a time of trouble such as never was. The good part about that is that we have to be taken from times of prosperity, and I'm confident that we'll be gone before that crash comes. We'll see. Time will tell. Well, we, in our considerations of Jehoiada, the priest, looking at a man who had an influence upon the affairs of the nation of Judah for well over a hundred years, at least a hundred years, in a lifetime of a hundred and thirty years. In consideration a fortnight ago, we looked at the tragic transition. We, we looked briefly at the lives of King Asa and his son Jehoshaphat, and we saw the enormous influence for good that they brought to bear upon the nation of Judah, uh, the state of the ecclesia uh, through their efforts. Uh, was uh, never to be attained again in their history. But, of course, in the height of his power, Jehoshaphat made a fatal mistake, and it was a fatal mistake. He decided, because of his political strength, that he was now in a position where he could make a political alliance with the house of Ahab, so he took Athaliah, their daughter, as a wife for his son Jehoram. Jehoram was to succeed him in due time. And we saw how that all of this panned out. The Second of Chronicles, chapter 17, was the story of, of Jehoshaphat being raised up by Yahweh. In fact, the language is quite graphic. He soared high, it says, in the ways of Yahweh. He was mightily blessed. That was the story of Second Chronicles 17. It just so happens that Jehoram's name means Yahweh raised. But then when the marriage alliance is made in 2 Chronicles 18, the switch comes. And from then on, it's all downhill. Athaliah just happens to mean Yah hath constrained. And that's the sad story that we're going to be talking about this evening. So those two chapters, 2 Chronicles 17 and 2 Chronicles 18, set out those, those two paths uh, of uh, Jehoshaphat's life. It's tragic because, you see, when it came time for a genealogy to be written concerning the Son of God, it was necessary because of the events of Second Chronicles, chapter 18 onwards, to leave out four rulers, four forgotten rulers. I want you to come to Matthew chapter 1. Now, if you were asked on behalf of your family to trace back the generations of your family. I don't want to do that because I'd be probably embarrassed by it, but I know that some in my family have done that. I haven't bothered to look at their research results. But if you were to trace back through your family and you, uh, you, know, you, you put together a genealogy, what do you think your family would say that when someone studied it, they found that you'd left out three generations and four individuals. They'd probably say, well, come, what on earth are you doing? 
But what's this about? Well, that's exactly what happens in Matthew chapter 1. There are four forgotten rulers. Now, this is the record of Matthew chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. And Asa begat Jehoshaphat, and Jeho Jeho Jehoshaphat begat Joram. That's fine up to there. And then we read, And Joram begat Ozias. Well, that's not correct. Now, you can see on the screen the situation here. Missing from this list are three generations, sons of David. And, of course, Athaliah, the, uh, the uh, ruler who, uh, who injected herself for six years uh, into the scheme of things. So here we've got Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. The Ozias, or Uzziah, of Matthew chapter 1 and verse 8 uh, is, of course, the son of Amaziah, not the son of Jehoram. So here we've got a genealogy, and of course, as you well know, that this is a very well-structured genealogy. So you have 14 generations, and three of them, I believe. So why would God leave them out? Now, th that doesn't make much logical sense, does it? Well, they are left out, and tonight we're going to explore why that is the case. And I guess there are some very real lessons in this, because when it comes up, when it becomes time for Yahweh to write up the people, to count the people, it is going to be a sad fact of history that many who ought to have been in the kingdom will not be there. They will have been left out. Their names which were once written in the book of life will no longer be in the book of life in the day of judgment. So there's that element of it to consider as well. Now, Jehoiada, of course, was operating as a, virtually as a king during at least 30 years of this period, during the reigns of Ahaziah, uh, Athaliah, as we're going to see uh, this evening, and, of course, about 30, 20 or something years into the, to the life of or the reign of King Joash. So approximately about 30 years and maybe a bit more of this period, Jehoiada the priest is really... He is the linchpin. He's the one upon which Judah depends for guidance and, and direction. He has to be very careful about it because, of course, Athaliah would take off his head. He's very, very careful about it, but he's the one behind the scenes who is pulling the strings and, of course, organising the overthrow of Athaliah that Joash, the rightful heir to the throne, the only surviving member of the House of David, by the way, uh, can accede to the throne as a, a seven-year-old, incredibly seven-year-old. But that's the awful history that came from the decision made by Jehoshaphat. From that position of enormous strength, the house of David comes down to rely upon the life of one six-month-old child. Incredible, isn't it? That's what happens when you make wrong decisions that have an impact upon the ecclesia. So what's the actual history? Well, this is the actual history. Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, begat Ahaziah, who reigned for two years and was slain by Jehu. And we've read about that in the, in the second of Chronicles this evening. On his death, his mother Athaliah slew all of his children except for the youngest, Joash. And we'll, we'll talk about that story a little later on. Athaliah was to rule... Judah for six years. Did, did you notice the last verse of Second Chronicles 22? Second Chronicles 22 said this, And he, Joash, was with them, namely with Jehoiada and Jehoshaphat, hid in the house of God six years, and Athaliah reigned over the land. You ever look at the last verse of chapter 23, the next chapter where she's overthrown, you read this. Verse 21 of Second Chronicles 23. And all the people of the land rejoiced. And the city was quiet after that they had slain Athaliah with the sword. So you see, she ruled over the land. She did not rule over the people of the land. So who was ruling over the people of the land? 
Well, just cast your eyes at 2 Chronicles 23 and verse 13. Athaliah in verse 12 hears the noise of the crowning of young boy King Joash. Verse 13 says, And she looked, and behold, the king stood at his pillar at the entering in, and the princes and the trumpets by the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and sounded with trumpets, etc. So you see, she's ruling over the land, but she's not ruling over the people of the land. That's being done by the real king here. You know who the real king is? Well, the one that they buried with the kings. His name was Jehoiada. He was the real king at this time. So that's a, that's a fascinating way, isn't it, that the scripture actually presents that little point. Joash acceded to the throne, aged seven years, and he reigned for 40 years. Amaziah, his son, reigned 29 years and begat Uzziah. So why are those four rulers missing from Matthew chapter 1? What's the spirit doing by omitting them? Well, of course, it's upholding the divine righteousness. Now, we don't perhaps need to go back to this record of 1 Kings chapter 21 because I think most of us are familiar with the history. This is the chapter that deals with the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. Remember the man that that Ahab wanted to displace, he wanted to buy his inheritance off him, that he, might, that he might plant a vegetable garden, a garden of herbs. He wanted the vineyard of Naboth. And Naboth said, no, 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 this is not my land. This, this land was given to me by Yahweh. The land is his. You can't, I can't sell it to you. And Ahab said, well, why not? Yeah, the word of God didn't mean anything to him, but it meant a lot to Naboth. So he went home heavy and displeased, says the record, and he said, well, he didn't say anything to Jezebel, he was sulking. And she comes in and says, what are you sulking for? And he says, well, Naboth wouldn't sell me the vineyard. She said, come on, stop boo-hooing like a baby. We can handle this. So she wrote letters. She wrote letters from Samaria to the elders of Jezreel, the record tells us, and says, Mate, put Naboth on a pedestal. Raise him up on high. Praise him up. You know, put him up there as the, as the ideal citizen. And then bring in two or three men and accuse him of all sorts of horrible things, of treason and other, and other things, and go out and stone him. And they did that, of course. Not only did they stone Naboth, but they stoned his sons. Why did they need to stone his sons? Well, because if they didn't stone them, they would have been the inheritors of the land. So they got rid of the whole of the male, all of the males of the family, anyone who could inherit the land. And so Ahab seized it. But it wasn't very long. He didn't get a chance to pick his vegetables. And Elijah was in the vineyard of Naboth. And he condemned him. And this is the condemnation. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity. And will cut off from Ahab every male, and him that is shut up and left in Israel. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, that was wiped out, to a man. And like the house of Baasha the son of, a, of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger, and made Israel to sin. So there was the divine edict. Now, we know what happened. Ahab actually humbled himself. Now, here's a Baal worshipper. Here's the worst king of Israel's history. Yet he humbled himself when he heard that condemnation. And Yahweh said, well, okay, I will ameliorate that judgment. It's still going to fall, but I'll, I'll ameliorate it, and the worst of it will come in the days of your son. That's the God that we serve. Even with a man like Ahab, he could back away from the, from the awful things uh, that, uh, that this condemnation brought upon him, at least to some degree because of that man's humility in the face of the condemnation. But it, it doomed his house. That's one reason why these four rulers are left out of Matthew chapter 1. But there's another one, as we're going to see. So let's just review the history of Ahab's family tree and David's line that becomes intermingled with it. 
So we have Ahab and this wonderful harlot uh, from Sidon, uh, Jezebel, whose name means chaste, one of the most, one of the greatest misnomers in the Bible. I mean, this is the C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste. And they had a daughter, Athaliah, who was married to Jehoram, the, the heir of the throne of Judah. There was another son, Ahaziah. This is, the, this is the fellow who fell down through the lattice, probably drunk, uh, from his roof and sent off to Beelzebub to find out whether he can survive this accident. And Elijah meets his messengers and then comes to the king and condemns him. He dies after two years. He had no son. And so his brother, Jehoram, who wasn't quite as bad as Ahaziah, um, he was killed by Jehu. And his progeny were also annihilated in that decimation of the house of Ahab. Athaliah's sons in Judah were taken captive by invaders. You might want to just cast your eye across to verse 16 of 2 Chronicles 21. It says, Moreover, Yahweh stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of of the Philistines and of the Arabians that were near the Ethiopians, and they came up into Judah and break into it and carried away all the substance that was found in the king's house and his sons also, and his wives. Uh, sadly, not Athaliah. She, she survived. So they took away his other wives uh, and his sons. So there was, left, there was never a son left him, it says, save Jehoahaz, the younger of his sons. The margin will tell you that this is the... Ahaziah that we read about in the next chapter. Okay, so this Ahaziah in chapter 22, uh, we read about him being slain uh, by Jehu. Verse 9 of 2 Chronicles 22. He sought Ahaziah and they caught him, for he was hid in Samaria. They brought him to Jehu, and when they had slain him, they buried him. So this is not going too well, is it? The house of Ahab intermingled uh, with the line of David. Now, the sons of Ahaziah, well, they had the great privilege of being slaughtered by their grandmother. The grandchildren of Athaliah are going to die at the hand of their grandmother. Now, that's incredible, isn't it? We'll come to the details of that a little later on. And the only survivor in the house of David was a six-month-old baby. And we're going to see how he survived and how that plays a very important part later on in the historical account. So there's the record. We know the facts. We've got to answer the, the second question as to why these four rulers are left out of the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1. And here's the reason. The reason is the character of the true God. Now, you'll notice... The word true uh, is in quotation marks. And the reason for that is because it actually comes uh, from Second Chronicles 15, verse 3. You may recall we went back and we had a look at the life of King Asa and the prophet came out to, to encourage him. And this is part of the statement that was made at that time. Now, for a long season, Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. Well, they had a teaching priest now because Jehoiada had just become a priest at age 30 when this statement was made. But they were without the true God. But they had a true God now because Asa was leading them back to the true God. Now, this true God is true. He's true to his word. He's true to the statements that he's made in the past. And this is one of them. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 9. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, that is to false gods, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, thy God, am a jealous God. Now, this is bringing up the issue. This is about, this is about people who worship false gods, idolaters. This is what Yahweh is going to do to them. He says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And that is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 1. Because you see, the four who are excluded were all idolaters. Now you might say, but what about Jehoram? The, the, the husband of Athaliah, was he an idolater? Well, 
He may have been, but the record doesn't state that. If you have a look at the record of 2 Chronicles chapter 21, you read this in verse 5. It says in verse 5, 2 Chronicles 21, Jehoram was 30 and 2 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 8 years in Jerusalem, which means he dies at age 40. He doesn't get too far in life, does he? And the way he died, I mean, if you had a lottery, you would never, ever pick the way he died. He died by reason of his bowels falling out through the severest case of dysentery in history. Very, very unpleasant. So this man is there for eight years. You know that for, for much of that eight years, he was actually reigning alongside of his father. So you see, he couldn't bring in idolatry. Oh yes, doubtless in her little private room, Athaliah was serving the gods of her father and mother. But they couldn't go on public display. So there's no mention made of, of Jehoram being an idolater. He had the correcting influence of his father, therefore a good portion of that eight years. goes on to talk about how he wrought evil after the pattern uh, of the house of Ahab because he had the daughter of Ahab to wife in verse 6. So his behaviour, and of course we're going to see a little bit of his behaviour in a moment, was horrendous. His moral behaviour because of his wife Athaliah and, and her influence upon him. So in summary, the three generations of David's line are destroyed for apostasy and idolatry. That is, the three sons of David. Who were they? Well, we're going to see who they were. Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. They were all idolaters. And the four rulers, this includes those three, plus Athaliah, are forgotten because of the edict against Ahab's house. And to boot, of course, Athaliah was herself an idolater. So there are the two reasons, brethren, sisters and young people, as to why they're left out of Matthew chapter 1. The, the fact that God said that if you serve false gods and idols, then the vengeance will be upon, uh, upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. And this is the important phrase, of them that hate me. What does that mean? Of them that hate me. Well, it means that they bow down to false gods. That's what it means. You bow down to false gods and serve them, then you hate Yahweh. And so for that reason, these are left out. And of course, the doom of Ahab's house. So I think we've probably done enough in relation to the four forgotten rulers and the reason that they have been omitted from Matthew chapter 1. We're going to have a look now at how this is all restored. Because you remember the Matthew 1 says that Jehoram begat Ozias or Uzziah. These three generations of David's house missed out, uh, just forgotten. Well, who is this Uzziah and why was it that he's the next one mentioned in Matthew 1? Well, of course, he wasn't an idolater. Did he fail? Yes. Yes, he he went into the temple to burn incense, you recall, and was smitten in the forehead with leprosy, and he seems, seems as though he died in that condition. Did he serve false gods? No. So that's why the restoration of Isaiah uh, occurs uh, in Matthew chapter 1. The first king of Judah since Jehoshaphat not to be an idolater. Experienced great success and was blessed beyond measure. Now we're going to talk about this man, Isaiah, God willing, in our final study uh, in December, if we get that far. Through his overconfidence and pride, which led him to try and emulate Jehoiada as a king priest. Remember, uh, Jehoiada's example was there. He would have heard about the history of that man who was both uh, a priest and effectively a king. He would have heard about David operating as a king priest when he brought the ark to Zion and so on. Well, he got to the point where he believed that he really was the Messiah. He could be the Messiah. So great was his success and the blessing of Yahweh upon him that he began to feel that Messiah couldn't do any better than what he did. The only problem he had, he wasn't priest. So he tried to take the high priesthood as well as the throne. Unlike Jehoiada and David, he did not realise that being a king priest was only possible in type. David acknowledged that, of course, 
uh, in the offering of the sacrifices after six steps as they brought the ark uh, to Jerusalem. He spoiled the type by his foolish presumption. But more about that, God willing, in due course. We're going to see the, the relevance and the importance of this statement. In the year King Isaiah died. Isaiah's presumption disqualified him to rule. He was succeeded by Jotham, a man whose name means the upright one and who's a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that in Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet sees a vision of Christ in glory as a king priest. You know, it begins that chapter by talking about, I saw Yahweh sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train, the word means his priestly garment, filled the temple. So here's a king priest. And we know, of course, from John chapter 12, and we'll look at this passage later on, that that was a vision of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ in the future. That was seen in the year that King Isaiah died. Hence, Matthew's gospel, uh, which, of course, is the, the gospel record, which deals uh, with the aspect of the lion of the four faces of the cherubim, therefore is heavily weighted towards the subject of Christ as the king, the lion of the tribe of Judah. How does it begin? Matthew 1 verse 1. This is the, says the generations. The word in the Greek is Genesis. This is the Genesis of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You have the three covenants. You've got the covenant of Genesis 3.15. The covenant made to David and the covenant made to Abraham, all there in the very first verse of the New Testament. So David's heir and ruler and Abraham's Melchizedek priest was the one foreshadowed in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Sadly, the man who restored the line of David to the genealogy of Isaiah, who thought he might be a great type of Messiah, wanted to become Messiah. He wasn't the man. And he was reduced to uh, a condition which excluded him from the house of God and apparently died in that condition and will be replaced in due time by the true son of David, the one who is the beloved, the true heir, and, of course, the greater Melchizedek. But more about that, God willing, later on. What I want to do now is to bring you to a consideration of some of the things in 2 Chronicles 21 and a bit more detail in chapter 22. Let's go back to 1 Chronicles, uh, sorry, 2 Chronicles 21. This is Jehoshaphat's family tree. Now we don't know, and this is in some respects a strange thing, we don't know Jehoshaphat's wife's name. She's unnamed in the record. Now usually the wives are named, at least most of the time they're named, but not here. But children came, and he probably had more than one wife because there were two Azariahs in his family. Here he is. Uh, Jehoshaphat has these children. Jehoram, the eldest, to whom he insisted on giving the throne uh, because he was the firstborn, he was married to Athaliah. He had a brother, Azariah. There was Jehoel, there was Zechariah, there was Michael, and there was Shephatiah. These all may have been one from the same mother, we don't know. But there's another Azariah, which would probably indicate that there was another wife involved. Whatever, it didn't last too long. You can look at the record of 2 Chronicles 21. They listed off for us those sons of Jehoshaphat in verse 2. I won't read those names again. But it says in verse 3 that their father gave them great gifts of silver and of gold, and of precious things with fenced cities in Judah. But the kingdom gave he to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. That's the kind of integrity that Jehoshaphat had. Now when Jehoram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword, and divers also of the princes of Israel. Now I wonder who gave him the hit list. I'll give you one guess. You've only got one guess. Who put the hit list together? As soon as Jehoshaphat died, he bumps off all of his brothers because there might be competition to the throne. Well, I don't think we have to guess, do we? We know who it was. It was Athaliah. 
She's the woman in the next chapter who goes around cutting the throats of her own grandchildren. She'd have no problem cutting the throats of her brothers-in-law. And moreover, she made sure that on that hit list there were the effective leaders of Judah. She missed one name. And that name was Jehoiada the priest. She probably didn't have the gumption to put his name on the list. But she got rid of the advisors of Jehoshaphat, the ones who were sound in their direction. She got rid of them as well as the competition from his brothers. So all of these are slain by Jehoram, their older brother. They all meet an untimely end. And of course, we've, we've read the record that the sons of Jehoram and Athaliah were taken away uh, by the invaders in, in 2 Chronicles 21. And the only surviving son of their family is slain by Jehu, aged 22. Uh, and of course, the only son that survives Ahaziah is Joash. It's an absolutely horrible story. I mean, a fiction writer would have difficulty coming up with some of this stuff. But it's in the word of God. It tells us something about human nature and it tells us a lot about making correct decisions in life. You know, make correct decisions, you pay a heavy price somewhere down the track. And that's what was happening here. So we can now come to chapter 22. It says in verse 1 that the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, his youngest son, king in his stead. For the band of men that came up with the Arabians to the camp had slain all the eldest. Now, we were told that they were taken away in the previous chapter. They took away, they carried away captives in verse 17 of chapter 21. But now we're told in verse 1 that the sons of the king were slain. And Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. And then it says in verse 2, 40 and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. Now that should be 22. This is one of those occasions where a copyist of the text, uh, perhaps, we don't know the exact circumstances, but someone somewhere down the track has either improperly copied or deliberately changed. We don't know, but it's not correct. If you have a look at 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 26 in your own time, if you want to jot that down, I think it's in the margin anyway. If you have a look at 2 Kings chapter 8 and verse 26, you will see that this man, Ahaziah, was actually 22 years of age. And if you do the sums, if you do any uh, work on the chronology of the kings of Israel and Judah, you will know it was an impossibility for him to be 42. Uh, his father died when his father was 40. So that sort of makes it a bit difficult, doesn't it? So he was 22 years of age, a young man thrust into a position of responsibility and, of course, he had, he had a mentor. And we're going to read about his mentor. We read about her at the end of verse 2. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. Hang on. That's not correct. She was the granddaughter of Omri. We've just been told that Athaliah is the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So why does it say that Athaliah is the daughter of Omri? Now, when you read the scripture, you've got to one, sort of bring other evidence to bear. But you've, you've got to think, you've got to say, well, hang on, that's not factually correct. Why would the spirit do that? There is a very, very important reason why it does that. And we're going to see that that reason is given in the next verse, verse 3. It says, He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counsellor to do wickedly. Now this is very important. I want you to if you keep something in Second Chronicles 22, if you can, pop something in there and come to Micah chapter 6 and verse 16. Micah 6 and verse 16. I only want a few words out of this. We're not going to look at the context so much. Just the formula. That's what we want. And it is a formula. 
In Micah 6 and verse 16 we read, For the statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and ye walk in their counsels. Notice the language. The statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and ye walk in their counsels. So what was happening in Israel happened in Judah as well. Micah's telling us that. So what does that mean? Well, that actually comes from history. And the history is that of Cush and Nimrod. Now, I'm going to get on my hobby horse here, Cush and Nimrod. I don't think we fully appreciate how much those two men have fashioned and framed the religious world in which we live. Catholicism comes directly from Cush and Nimrod. Cush was the great original prophet of the Babylonian mysteries. Brethren, sisters and young people, he wrote the Catholic catechism. Now it wasn't called that in Cush's time, but it became that later on in our time. What we have in the Catholic catechism with all of their doctrines adopted largely by nearly every other religious organisation uh, in the Christian arena comes from the brain of a man called Cush. He later on became known as Bell. Bell was one of his titles. His symbol was a hammer. And the reason for that was because, of course, he had her son, whose name was Nimrod, who led a rebellion that brought about the scattering of all peoples and the confusion of their tongues. You know, you do with a, with a hammer, <laughs> a thousand bits. Well, in this case, it was 70. That's what happened through the, through the machinations of this man, Cush. It was Nimrod who was the implementer of Cush's ideologies and was... Omri, who was the statute maker, of Ahab's works. So Omri made the statutes, very, very powerful man, like Cush was a powerful man. And his son implemented them. The statutes of Omri are kept and the works of the house of Ahab. Now this is the way it works, brethren, sisters and young people. If you have powerful teachers and counsellors, effective people, charismatic people sometimes, like Cush and Omri were, you have people that can get into the brains of others, especially their children, you can go a long way. You can get your sons or your people to listen to your counsel, you can go a long way. That's what happened with Cush and Nimrod. That's what happened with Omri and Ahab. And that's what's happening back here in Second Chronicles chapter 22. So come back and read those verses again. With that formula from Micah 6 verse 16 ringing in our ears, we understand why she's called the daughter of Omri and not the daughter of Ahab. His mother's name also was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counsellor to do wickedly. Wherefore he did evil in the sight of Yahweh like the house of Ahab, for they were his counsellors after the death of his father to his destruction. See it? That's the reason for that. By the way, the name Ahab, who was, of course, the true father, the actual father of Athaliah, means resembling the father. Isn't that interesting? Resembling the father, the statutes of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ picks this up. We won't go there in Revelation chapter 2. But when he writes to Thyatira, he says, look, I've only got one thing against you. Just one thing, you Thyatirans. And you've got to deal with it. Otherwise, I'm going to kill her children with death, he means the one thing that they had that they had to get rid of. What was that? Her name was Jezebel. Not, not a literal Jezebel, 
but a class in the meeting who were what, doing what? Teaching and seducing my servants to commit spiritual fornication. That was the class. They were counsellors. And he says, you don't get rid of her. I will kill your children with death, which is exactly what happened. You can go to Thyatira today, you will not find a Christadelphian ecclesia. They're long since gone. Their names have been blotted out of the book of life and not in the genealogy. That's the lesson of that. So the scripture is putting these things in a, in a very powerful way, but if, unless you read it carefully, it's not going to become apparent to you. I want to conclude now on what happens on the death of Ahaziah. We read, of course, in verse 9, that when Ahaziah went down to see his, uh, his brother-in-law, his, um, hang on, I'll get that right, his relation, who had been wounded by, by the king of, of Syria and then found himself on the wrong end of the sword of Jehu, he dies, he's buried. And, of course, it says at the end of verse 9 that they said, we're going to bury him amongst the kings, or we're going to bury him because he's the son of Jehoshaphat who sought Yahweh with all his heart, which was true. So the house of Ahaziah had no power to keep still the kingdom. So what's going to happen now? Well, the, the, the implementer of the policies of Athaliah is dead. So she's got to take up the cudgels. The councillor's got to become the assassin. And that's what happens. Verse 10. But when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal of the house of Judah. Now, some of these, some of these were her own grandchildren. Now, there were other wives, doubtless, and so, you know, there's, uh, Ahaziah probably had a number of wives, and there are other, other kids. We don't know how many, but there were at least... Well, they were a considerable number because they miss one. Hands up the grandmother who doesn't know how many grandchildren she's got. Most of you grandmothers, and there are some very good grandmothers in this ecclesia, very, very good grandmothers. Not only do they know the number of grandchildren they've got, some of them have got great-grandchildren, and they know the number of them too. And moreover, they know their birthdays. Hands up the fathers who know the birthdays of their children. Oh, yes, there's a few. I can rattle mine off. I'm not boasting, but I can. But don't ask me the birthdays of my brother's children. That's, that's long since gone. So you see the point I'm making? Grandmothers don't do this, do they? So what kind of woman would go around cutting the throats of her own grandchildren. Why would she do that? Well, because they're in the way of her rulership. She wants to rule. So who's she? She's the daughter of Omri. Eh? This is what comes when you get wrong-headed thinking in a powerful human being that goes down through implementers like Ahab, right down. It just keeps on regurgitating itself over and over in history. That's what's happening here. It's an awful situation for the, for the ecclesia of God to be in. So what's God's answer to this? Well, it's a very curious answer. It comes about through a curious marriage. Let's read on, verse 11. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons. And I'll give you the way the Hebrew is structured. Stole him away from among the king's sons that were being slain. That's how it should read. That were being slain. In other words, this was all happening very quickly. As soon as Athaliah got news that Ahaziah, her son, was dead, she said, right. She got a man and said, right, you follow me. Bring your sword, bring your dagger. Into this bedroom. 
That one's gone. Into the next one! And she did that until she could find no more. So you see, while they were being slain, this woman, Jehoshabath, takes action. Now her name just happens to mean whose oath is Yahweh. And she had made an oath to Yahweh. But she hadn't only just made an oath to Yahweh, she'd made an oath to her husband. You know who her husband was? Jehoiada the priest. That's quite incredible. She's the daughter of Jehoram, possibly by another wife, apart from Athaliah. You'd want to be, wouldn't you? She's the only recorded princess to marry the high priest. She could not have been any older than 28. That's the maximum age that she could have been, 28. You've just got to do the sums. You can work that out. Jehoiada could not have been any younger than 95. Hands up. Young sisters in our meeting here tonight who are under the age of 28 who would marry a 95-year-old brother. I won't see any hands. No way. But that's what happens here. You have a daughter of the house of David who could not be older than 28, who's married to a man who could not be younger than 95. That's incredible, isn't it? Well, it used to happen in those times occasionally. But I think Yahweh made sure it happened. Because, you see, their progeny, and they only had one, is going to become a magnificent type of the Son of God and would behave like him. We're going to see that in our studies, God willing. His name was Zechariah, a wonderful man, and a man who stood against the whole nation, against Joash, his, his uh, cousin, and against the princes, all of whom had stood with Jehoiada the priest while he was alive, but turned against him when he died, turned against the way of Jehoiada when he was off the scene. As I said, this produced a unique son. He was the son of a priest, a high priest, and therefore high priest elect, and the son of David. Ha ha ha. King priest. That's why he's a type of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he died between the age of, we can't be exact, somewhere between the age of 30 and 40, the age of our Lord Jesus Christ. But a lot more about that, God willing, in due time. See what happens here in verse 11. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she slew him not. So she had another woman with her, a nurse, we were told in that verse. So here is a young baby. He could not be much more than six months of age. He's whipped out of the hands of Athaliah and her cruel men going around cutting the throats of these little babies. And he's hidden. And then finally he's secreted away into the temple. And there he is with Jehoiada the high priest and Jehoshaphat his wife. And he's raised up there in the temple alongside of their son, Zechariah. Two boys grow up in the temple. Joash, the rightful heir to David's throne. Zechariah, heir to the high priesthood. And a son of David on his mother's side. So in our next study, God willing, we're going to have a look at what happens to this young boy. We don't read much about Zechariah until a little later on in the story. But they grow up together and we're going to find the tragedy that overtakes those two boys as time goes on.